We are going to start because there is so much to say that I don't want to take too much extra time. Good afternoon. I'm Lissy Medvedow, Executive Director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy here at BC Law School. On behalf of Dan Kempstrom, our Faculty Director, and Cindy Wynn, our Administrative Di Assistant, welcome to the kickoff program for the academic year. Before introducing today's program, I want to spend a minute sharing some information about the Rappaport Center. We are entering our fifth year here at BC, amazing. And each year, we bring policymakers, legislators, academics, and practitioners, really interesting people, to engage in really interesting conversations about really important policy issues. This year, our theme is equality, inequality, equity, inequity. And towards that end, we're starting with a program on race and public policy. In the next few months, we'll be holding programs on disparate impact in urban development, marijuana and equity, called Pot and Parity, and a full day conference on affordable housing, focusing on the rental market crisis. Interspersed, we'll have community addresses by our inaugural senior fellows and residents, three dynamic individuals, two law professors, and a practitioner, each coming to BC Law for a week to teach a seminar, give their community addresses, and meet with students and members of our community. Before you leave, I hope you'll take our list of programs. And now for today, in trying to decide how to open the year, Tanisha Sullivan, a BC Law alum, current president of the NAACP Boston branch, and newest member of the Rappaport Center Advisory Board suggested a program on race and public policy. The Rappaport team enthusiastically agreed. Shortly thereafter, the New York Times Magazine published the 1619 Project, looking at 400 years since the first enslaved Africans arrived in Virginia. The articles touch on how in virtually every social structure of society, education, housing, criminal justice, employment, economic development, and healthcare, through history to contemporary times, racial disparities still abound. Here we are in 2019, and some of us, myself included, are not nearly as aware as we should be of the prevalent impact of racial disparities. And why is that? Keeping this personal for me, it's because I am not confronted with racial discrimination on a daily basis or ever. I have never, for example, have what's been characterized to me as the conversation to have with my children to just put your hands up if ever stopped by the police. Acknowledging systemic racism is a beginning, and having conversations like the one we're about to have today will continue to help raise our consciousness individually and collectively. This is important work. So without further ado, ado I want to introduce Tanisha Sullivan. As I said, Tanisha is the president of the NAACP Boston branch with one of the largest membership rosters in New England and a legacy of committed service. The NAACP Boston branch is a leading voice in issues of racial diversity, economic justice, equity and opportunity in public education, and the elimination of health disparities in and around greater Boston. Professionally, Tanisha is Associate General Counsel to a biotech company in Cambridge. Before that, she practiced corporate law in the greater Boston and New York City areas. Passionate about public service, she left corporate practice from 2013 to 2015 to serve in a senior policy role with the Boston Public Schools as the district's chief equity officer. She has a BA in government from the University of Virginia, a law degree from here, as you heard, an MBA from BC's Carroll School of Management. She has served on a number of nonprofit boards. She's currently on the regional leadership team of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority and is a member of the WGBH Board of Advisors. She's also been the recipient of many prestigious and professional recognitions, including the 2018 Leading Woman Award from the Girl Scouts of Eastern Mass, the MLK Legacy Award from St. Cyprian's Church, and the BBJ 40 Under 40 recognition. 
please welcome Tanisha Sullivan, who will then introduce our very esteemed additional panelists. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, I think, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. So a few lessons in that, right? When you lift your voice to make recommendations, be prepared to actually do the work. <laughs> so I ended up here. Um, and make sure that you have wonderful friends who are incredibly dynamic and brilliant and uh, have, from a practitioner standpoint, certainly driven impact in and around the city so that when you call at the not last minute exactly, but you know, you call at t towards the tail end of the summer, they say yes. Um, so I'm really excited because I will have the opportunity to introduce you to both Rasan Hall and Dr. Brandon Terry, who are incredibly dynamic. I'm looking forward to this conversation um, today, hopefully as much as you are. Um, but before I get started, I do want to, of course, say thank you um, to Professor Canstrom and Lissy and Cindy uh, for the work that they do every day through um, the Rappaport Center and also to BC. Dean, thank you um, for your ongoing support of this very important work around um, with respect to policy. I do want to um, just share very briefly with you, because I don't want to make any assumptions here, um, some information about the NAACP. The NAACP is the oldest civil rights organization in the country committed to the elimination of racial discrimination. For over 100 years, the NAACP has, through um, its influence in policy and in law, been able to really transform this country um, in a way that has brought about greater equity and opportunity for all people. When we think about the civil rights movement, specifically through a legal lens, the NAACP has been on the front lines, okay? Um, locally, NAACP branches are operated by volunteers, <laughs> okay? So that Jesuit education that I received, the commitment to service is being put into practice every day through the NAACP. So I do want to encourage those of you who are students to remember that it's not just about what you get, what you gather in these classrooms, <coughs> what you can get from a corporate law firm or from a corporation. It really does, it, it is very important that you also think about how you too can give back. Locally, our work is, of course, to support the national NAACP, um, its agenda. Um, and to also really create the space on the local level for other organizations like the ACLU, like Lawyers for Civil Rights, um, and other advocacy organizations to help create the space for them to do the work that they do. Um, we do not, you know, um, it is not our primary focus to uh, be programmatic and we, and we do not litigate directly but we work in partnership with organizations that do. So as Lizzie mentioned, as she was sharing with me with great excitement, what this year, the theme of this year would be um, for Rappaport, just my mind immediately, I said, so what's the conversation going to be about racial justice and racial equity? And Lizzie said, well, it's, you know, we're gonna talk, that is the focus, we're gonna talk about it all year. And as she and I continued to dialogue, what we both came to an understanding was that it was critically important that at the top of the year, we set aside time to talk specifically about race, to talk specifically about the intersection of race and public policy, how um, public policy can be used to either cement racist ideas or how public policy can be used to disrupt systemic racism. So today we are going to get very intentional and I encourage you as we move through the conversation to engage, um, you know, ask questions. I'll be, I'm participating, but I'm also facilitating. So when you feel the need to ask a question, I want you to ask the question. This is the time, this is the moment. Um, there are two things that I want, two thoughts that, um, that I want to leave with you to think about as we move through this conversation before I introduce Dr. Terry. <coughs> One is, and I, 
I just made reference to it. How can public policy be used to cement systemic racism into society? And how can public policy be used to disrupt systemic racism? The second is thoughtful policymakers take the time to understand the impact of policy on all people and seek to mitigate the adverse impact of public policy to the greatest extent possible for those who are most marginalized. So those two thoughts for you to just to keep in mind as we move through this conversation today. And again, I hope that this will be interactive. And if it isn't, uh, Professor Bloom already said that I can um, call on him. <laughs> payback, payback. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Terry. Dr. Terry is an assistant professor of African and African American Studies and Social Studies at Harvard University. He earned a PhD with University Distinction in Political Science and African American Studies from Yale University. He received his AB in Government and African and African American Studies from Harvard and received his Master's in Science in Political Theory Research at the University of Oxford. His current research project sits at the intersection of political theory, history, and African American studies. Tentatively titled, The Tragic Vision of the Civil Rights Movement, it is a reconstruction of the philosophical foundations of historiographical debates concerning the African American Civil Rights Movement and an attempt through a synthesis of methods drawn from political theory, philosophy of history, <laughs> literary theory, and African American studies to articulate the normative significance of these historical narratives given the widespread invocation of the example of the civil rights movement in contemporary political theory and public philosophy. I know you're going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to this project, Brandon is also working on a thematic philosophical study of black nationalist thought in the United States tentatively titled Sovereignty, Soulcraft, and Suffering, and other research projects on the political thought of Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and civil rights historiography. Brandon has written and or provided commentary for NPR, WGBH, The Huffington Post, The Baltimore Sun, The Point, The Nation, Time, MTV News, and more. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Terry. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so firstly, I just want to thank uh, Tanisha for not just setting this panel in motion, but for all of her uh, incredible leadership here in the greater Boston area. It's always an honor. There are not many people I come running when they call, but this, this is one of them. So it's an honor to be here, and I want to thank uh, everybody who organized this. Um, so, as you might have uh, noted from that obtuse biography, I am not exactly a public policy scholar, uh, but I am someone who works at the intersections of history, critical race theory, and political philosophy. And that means that I'm interested uh, in some other questions that I think are absolutely critical to any debates on public policy. And so what I hope to do is before we get into the weeds to kind of step back and ask what is it that we're doing when we engage in the crafting and uh, the, the justification of public policy. And so from philosophy I draw on a particular question to pose to public policy makers and that's the question of normativity or ethics. right? How ought we organize our society? So it's not just a question of what works, right? Asking what works presumes that we know what kinds of ideals or aims we're striving toward, right? There are always questions of justice that we can pose to both the policy itself and the practice of its implication. 
How ought we try to correct for certain injustices or mitigate their significance for people's lives in the present? One of the most pressing debates in the terrain of race and public policy is whether people can explicitly use race as a justification for public policy or whether all public policy must be crafted with quote unquote universal justifications. And we can talk more in the Q&A about whether uh, any public policy actually meets that standard of so-called so universality. Um, so, so I'm interested in those questions drawn from philosophy, but in critical race theory, I'm also interested in things that critical theorists, sociologists, and historians uh, try to investigate. And so among those are understanding how exactly it is that our society came to be so riven by racial injustice and why it's so difficult to achieve justice, especially on racial issues. So it's not just enough to craft a perfect picture of what a just society might be. You have to diagnose why it's so difficult for there to be buy-in in moving people towards the realization of justice. What kinds of ideologies or institutional arrangement, arrangements prevent us from understanding or acting on what justice demands? And so I think that gives us a kind of, introduces a sort of three-part framework that should guide all inquiry into public policy on race issues. So the first part of this is intensive historical study. So the great W.E.B. Du Bois, the greatest black intellectual of all time, uh, has this little vignette in The Souls of Black Folk that people often skip by, but I think it's one of the most important pieces of the book, and where he talks about the car window sociologist. Okay? And he means that uh, he, he gives a description of somebody who rides through the South on a <coughs> rail car looking out of the window and think, who thinks that they can, un, he says, unravel the snarl of centuries just by gazing out the window while they drive by. And that's the same thing you can think of what a lot of people do in the present. Of course, the car is now uh, an automotive vehicle, but it's the same sort of thing. People drive through Mattapan or Dorchester and Roxbury and think that they can unravel the snarl of centuries uh, with just a quick glance, and it doesn't work like that. We need to be exceptionally attuned to the complex causal stories behind the injustices we see. And some of these things are quite explicit. We might know to think about Jim Crow. We might know to think about slavery and the way that that's affected uh, educational opportunities, asset distributions. But we even need to look for injustice within ostensibly egalitarian <laughs> public policies. Because the history of public policy in America is full of tragic concessions to racial domination. Let me give you a few examples. So with Social Security, in order to get the buy-in of Southern quote-unquote liberals, Southern Democrats, uh, blacks had to be excluded from Social Security benefits. How was this established? Well, uh, the two categories of workers that were excluded from Social Security provisions were domestic laborers and agricultural laborers. Where were most blacks located in the uh, uh, job economy? Those two sectors. The Federal Housing Administration, which is more responsible, uh, more responsible than any other um, administration for creating wealth in America. Most wealth in the United States of America, not just your income, but your wealth, the amount of assets you and your family have on hand. The Federal Housing Administration is more responsible for creating wealth in the United States than any other organization. They produced an underwriter's manual that would guide both their backing of mortgages and the uh, recommendations that they made to private mortgage lenders. And what was in those recommendations? Well, they said you should not invest money in uh, individuals whose purchase of a mortgage would disrupt the uh, beneficial racial composition of a neighborhood. So if I wanted to integrate a neighborhood with my family, the Federal Housing Administration told mortgage lenders that I was not the type of person to lend money to. You think, well, that might be fine. Maybe you could just buy a house in your own neighborhood. That would seem plausible. But then the Federal Housing Administration also said that one should not invest in neighborhoods with undesirable racial elements that were deteriorating uh, and had certain kind of infrastructural things that basically ended up where almost all black neighborhoods were excluded from this thing. They were called redlining. So the entire city of Newark, New Jersey, for example, was basically excluded from, H from FHA-backed um, uh, mortgages and recommendations. 
So it made it almost impossible for people to get a scaffolding, black folks to get a scaffolding into the number one driver of wealth creation in the 20th century. And that's an egalitarian, progressive public policy. And it's hidden in there. Um, and that thing creates pathways. So then when you have something like the mortgage interest tax deduction, where we put a lot of federal funds into helping people buy homes and giving people money back for uh, extravagant mortgage outlays. Well, blacks are disproportionately excluded from those because they hadn't been able to get in on the front end of these home buying arrangements and had, hadn't had the wealth to pass down. If your family bought a house in Southie 80 years ago, they're millionaires now. Black people were not allowed to do that. <laughs> All right? So, this, so that's part one. Um, well, let me say one other thing really quickly. Uh, so not only should we be attuned to this, to the uh, indirect inegalitarian consequences of ostensibly egalitarian public policy, but we also have to be attuned to the utter complexity of social problems. So again, this goes back to the car window sociologist. So one of the things that race does ideologically is it provides a ready at hand answer to a lot of things. It seems like you can just kind of point at and assume the pathology of disadvantaged and stigmatized racial groups and throw up your hands and not have to explain things that are actually incredibly complex. Why are there so much violence in inner city neighborhoods? Right? Well, we can sort of point to people who we often talk about cultural pathologies and various family breakdowns. And one of the things that uh, sociologists have, who have now kind of started to come out from under their blinders under the influence of Du Bois have started to show is just how complicated these problems are. So great sociologist Chris Muller at Berkeley has shown in a series of papers how important lead poisoning and the lead pipes from older water systems has been to the historical evolution of violence in certain inner city neighborhoods which then sets an equilibrium of violence that persists well past the time people take those pipes out. So here's the thing that's like, you know, you can talk about pathology and self-hatred and violence and drug, and the water system actually plays a complicated role. So we don't know about this whole ecosystem unless we remain open to fallibility, inquisitiveness, curiosity, to try to understand these things. Right? Why has the violence declined so much in inner city neighborhoods? One important reason is cellular phones, right? In the 1990s, you used to have to control territory on major thoroughfares so that you could sell drugs to consumers coming in and out of the city from the suburbs. To control territory, as any of you who study military history know, is usually exceptionally violent, especially in an illicit business. The cell phone has radically changed drug dealing. Many of your students buy their drugs from people that they know, and they call them on their cell phones. <laughs> they don't have to drive down to the drug area to get their drugs. Less violence, right? That's really, really complicated. And if we don't have all of those inputs into public policy, we're going to go awry. I'll be quicker about the other two. So the other two legs of this, so that you've got this historical part. The other part is being um, attuned to and critical of racial ideology. So uh, as I said just a minute ago, there's a temptation to appeal to congealed racial difference and different ideas of racial inferiority to explain social inequality. What does that mean in, in English? So um, we are often really quick to ascribe pathological behaviors to stigmatize racial groups like African Americans. So one thing that we see is that there's exceptionally high, um, I think the number, the number is 40 deaths per 100,000. So 40 black women out of every 100,000 that are pregnant die in childbirth. It's exceptional. These are, these are uh, developing world numbers. Okay? And why is that? Right? For many people, they say, well, we could just talk about the fact these people don't take care of themselves, or uh, they're really uneducated, they don't understand these things. Well, what public health scholars who have started to look into this, to be shocked by these numbers, have shown is that what we have are cases where doctors actually are not even willing to acknowledge that people are in pain when they say they're in pain. For any of you who follow sports, Serena Williams almost died in childbirth. She's in exceptionally rich, <laughs> understands more about her body than anybody we know, and she's telling doctors, I'm in pain, something's not right. And they're telling her, no, 
Why is that? Well, we have a long tradition in this country of ideology that says black women can bear more pain than anyone else. Right? The invention of gynecology, right? It's, uh, Dr. Sims, whose statue is in front of the State House in Montgomery, Alabama, practiced gynecology, invented modern gynecology by experimenting on black enslaved women without anesthesia based on the theory that they didn't feel pain in the same way that white women feel pain. These are deep-seated ideological things that, again, the ready-at-hand thing is, well, these people, they don't want to take care of themselves, they're eating too much uh, uh, unhealthy food and things like that, instead of looking at our own practices and how they might produce these outcomes. Last piece, and this is, uh, I think, a really important piece, the one that falls mostly out in, in um, public policy debates, and this is a question of normative principles and values. So again, we have to evaluate public policy and the demands of public policy ethically. How do we attack forms of intolerable injustice and unfair inequality while respecting people's dignity, while respecting their self-respect and their moral and civic agency? When we ask the question, what works, it needs to be done against the arguments about what justice requires and what values are informing our public policy. And we have to make sure that our policy interventions take into account the basic structure of the broader society to make sure that we're arranging the benefits and burdens of social cooperation fairly. And so what might this mean concretely? So really, really quick example. So one is you take food stamps. Right? It's the only uh, welfare policy that's expanded in the last 40 years, partly because it's tied to the uh, farm bill and not um, you know, health and Human Services. It's actually a farmer subsidy more than it is a welfare program. Uh, but for the last few decades, we've put extreme punitive restrictions on what people can actually buy with their food stamps, right? Certain kinds of prepared food you can't buy. There's restrictions on the categories. None of these respect people's judgment about what their family might want or need at particular times. You can't you can't skimp on one week and add more in another week because you want to celebrate a child's birthday or you want to have a special event for your family. Things that all of us do all the time and are totally capable of making decisions about. We don't trust poor people, and particularly poor black people, to make those kinds of decisions. We also um, think about something like uh, the extremely punitive offense, of the, the extremely punitive way we treat people who enroll their kids in suburban school districts. So actually, if you're caught illicitly enrolled in a suburban school district, you can be prosecuted for fraud because you've stolen tax dollars from the suburban school district. And you know, you felony charge is a lot, a lot of money. Right? Um, well, one of the things that we might ask against that kind of punitive response is whether the existing set of the existing distribution of benefits and burdens across a metropolitan region in terms of education is fair. If it's not, that might undermine the legitimacy of the punishments we seek to mete out for people who are trying to find their children a better education. Last thing I'll say uh, very quickly is that um, we might also think about unemployment this way. Right? So right now we frame unemployment as a problem. Uh, the thing to do with unemployment is to get people jobs. Well, the question is what kind of jobs are you getting them? How are they treated at those jobs? How are they compensated at those jobs? What kind of powers do they have to control their workplace at those jobs? Can't just be put people into the workforce under any condition. Their refusal to enter the workforce might be an expression of their self-respect and dignity, that they don't want to take certain kinds of jobs that are humiliating, degrading, or exploitative, and that their refusal to do so should be taken as a signal that we might need to intervene on the other side rather than simply restructuring their souls so that they're more appropriate uh, uh, um, uh, that, they're, that they're more attuned to the kind of discipline they need in the existing economy. So I just want to put those pieces on the table, a kind of historical vantage, one that's uh, got a critique of racial ideology at the forefront, and one that doesn't lose track of the normative and evaluative questions about public policy. Um, and I think all of those are backed by the kind of vision that Martin Luther King and other left radical members of the civil rights movement defended um, because they put the idea of public participation first and civic and moral agency first in the, in the development of public policy. And um, I think that's the kind of vision that we need to recover for the present. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.
said to Rasan, we're going from the professor to the preacher. <laughs> because uh, Rasan Hall is a graduate of the Ohio State University. <laughs> and also Northeastern School of Law and Andover Newton Theological School, um, where he received his master's in divinity. He is an ordained reverend in the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. I was gonna say Dr. Hall. I think I'm gonna be prophetic in this moment. Okay. <laughs> A very good friend too. Um, Rasan is the director of the Racial Justice Program for the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, the ACLU. In this role, Rasan helps develop their integrated advocacy approach to address racial justice issues. Through legislative advocacy, litigation, and community engagement, the program works on issues that deeply impact communities of color and historically disenfranchised communities. Rasan also manages the What a Difference a DA Makes campaign to educate state residents about the power and influence of district attorneys. Prior to joining the ACLU of Massachusetts, Rasan was the Deputy Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice and headed up the Voting Rights Project. Rasan has also worked as an Assistant District Attorney for Suffolk County, where he prosecuted drug, gang, and homicide cases. He currently serves on the Massachusetts Legal Assistant Corporation's Board of Directors, the Himes Foundation Board of Trustees, and is a member of the Massachusetts IOLTA Committee. I am excited to hear from Rasan specifically as he talks about really the intersection of practice with policy. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Denise, uh, for that. Um, my one cautionary note is, especially after hearing uh, such a brilliant. Uh, <coughs> overview and framework from Dr. Terry uh, and knowing uh, what uh, Attorney Sullivan brings to the table, please don't approach us afterwards and say, you're so articulate. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, you're, you're, you're on notice. Hey, we could talk about why that's problematic afterwards, but just do yourselves and us a favor. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to come here and have this conversation um, and, and for the work uh, that's being done and being intentional about discussing uh, race, particularly in this setting, because uh, you all gathered here are the, the, the leaders of, of our society. Uh, whether it is deserved or not, the title of attorney, of Esquire, carries an extra weight with it. There is a different reaction that people give me when they find out that I'm attorney hall. Uh, there is a reason uh, on my business cards I include Esquire after my name. Uh, some people think it's you know, a little pretentious, and I, I do too. Um, <laughs> but, but as a black man navigating this space, doing political and legal advocacy, where it doesn't say I'm a staff attorney, uh, I feel the need to wear that moniker. And, and because of that, uh, there is a level of deference, uh, whether deserved or not, uh, that I receive. Uh, I also recognize that there's some privileges around uh, height and uh, maleness. Uh, so I, I, I lean into those, and hopefully I can use them for the benefit uh, of the least among us and those who have been historically marginalized. That said, uh, I'd like to kind of look at the practical applications of, of race and public policy from two perspectives, and that is uh, the policy makers uh, and then the policies themselves. I think thinking about race and public policy, it's important to consider uh, the, the historical underpinnings of uh, this nation. Uh, to understand and be intentional, intentional uh, in talking about white supremacy. And, and when I talk about white supremacy, I don't mean neo-Nazis and, and skinheads or the alt-right, but I'm talking about a system of beliefs uh, and values uh, and behaviors and laws that uh, advantage white people uh, and overwhelmingly and disproportionately disadvantage uh, people of color. Uh, it, is the, it is the narratives that exist, the practices, the assumptions uh, that get made, the things that uh, get valued. And so 
recognizing that that uh, thread runs through this nation's history from its original sins of genocide and slavery, uh, it's important, it, it, it provides further context uh, when, we, when we look at how policymakers uh, operate when it comes to race, uh, how policymakers who are people of color uh, are uh, constrained in many ways, and then what the impact of some of the policies uh, are. And so thinking about some of the policy makers, particularly, it, there is this belief in, in the value of, of democracy and civic engagement in this country and this notion of specifically being a, a representative democracy, uh, that we have the power to elect people of our choice to represent our interests in our community. Uh, and you know, the first time that even began to happen was in the Reconstruction uh, period, immediately after the Civil Rights, for black people uh, at least. There was, you know, to the extent that there was a recognition of our humanity and our citizenship uh, because of the uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which, you know, 13th Amendment also included those compromises that Dr. Terry uh, talked about. So everybody wasn't free because if you could be duly committed, convicted of a crime, you could still be subjected uh, to, to slavery. But it, it took the imposition of federal troops to allow black people uh, to have full citizenship rights uh, in, in that period of time. And in the immediate aftermath, the withdrawal uh, of those federal troops in the post-Reconstruction era, uh, we see the rise of the Klan. We see public policy that begins to criminalize black life. You see the rise of black codes, anti-miscegenation laws, uh, anti-vagrancy laws. And so the, the policy makers that were black people in those times had a very limited duration uh, and, and did their best uh, to represent uh, the people in their community. When you look at uh, the, the post-civil rights era, because of the organizing that came out of the civil rights movement, uh, there were uh, uh, pockets of political power uh, that began to develop and exist in larger urban centers where there were larger uh, concentrations of black people. And that's where we see in Chicago and in Detroit and in Newark uh, greater representation. And now thinking about some of the activism that has led to a shift um, in, in the political makeup of of Congress, but even at the, the local level, there are a couple of things that come into play. Uh, how do we get the districts that we have? Part of that is, is redistricting. Uh, part of that is also segregation. There's a reason why there are such high concentrations of people of color, and particularly black people, in large uh, urban centers. And so to the extent that there are representatives, uh, it, it is uh, because there is a, a, um, a large enough collection of people that their votes get cast in a way that they can uh, elect a candidate of their choice. And these candidates are coming out of communities that have higher rates of poverty, um, higher rates of low educational, un, uh, low educational attainment, a uh, higher concentration of low value or substandard housing stock. And when you think about uh, the, the political maneuvering of individuals either in the state house or in Congress, uh, their base is in some instances who provides them their power. And it's these uh, small areas uh, of concentrated uh, poverty and concentrated numbers of people of color uh, that provide, relatively speaking, compared to um, other communities, a, a, a weaker base. And that is because of the history of slavery, segregation, racism, and white supremacy uh, in, in this country. Uh, I think the intentional advocacy uh, to increase that power is something that we're seeing a greater shift in. I look at uh, the election of Congresswoman Ayanna Pressley uh, here in the city of Boston. It was because of the work of advocates that led to her ultimately getting there. And it was the work that happened before uh, she actually announced she was running. It was the work that happened in 2011. Mm -hmm. Because the district that she won, there were a group of us who were a part of a coalition called Drawing Democracy. And it was that coalition that advocated for expanding the boundaries of District 7 to include 
more people of color so that it could be a majority minority district so that the people in that community could elect, could elect a candidate of their choice. And there was a, and so that happened, that district was, uh, was created and it laid the groundwork and created the number of people uh, that could vote for uh, Congresswoman Presley. There are certainly a lot of other factors that played into it, the kind of anti-Trump sentiment uh, that exists in the nation, her own skill at, uh, as, a, as a politician and what she brings to the table, and the, organi the organizing power of a lot of grassroots individuals uh, to do that work and to get out there. Um, but it's the, the foresight and the planning. But it shouldn't have to take that much work uh, to get to that place. And there's this constant uh, struggle that advocates and people of color, particularly black people, are, are up against where there are these regressive movements to uh, alter voting districts, to impose barriers um, to, to voting rights. And so the lack of representation uh, that people of color have in this country is directly tied to this history of, of racism. And so to the extent that there will be laws introduced that, uh, or policies that get introduced that address some of the systemic issues, that address uh, some of the disparities, the power base and the number of people to take that on is, is diminished because of who this country is. Looking at uh, some of the, the policies, there have been both well-intentioned policies, compromised policies, bad policies, uh, and within most of those, there has been uh, the absence of meaningful conversations about race. I mean, I think you can look to um, the Civil Rights Act of the late 1800s, you can look to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you can look to the Voting Rights Act of 65. There was intentional conversation about racial discrimination, and these were measures to address that specifically. Uh, but some of the housing policies and the zoning uh, policies that get enacted time after time, they're devoid of any conversation uh, of race. When we think about 1994's crime bill, uh, and, and, and here's where it gets tricky, to address the issue of the crack e epidemic in large urban centers, you have a lot of people coming to the table, including black elected officials, to say this is the tool that we need. And that's problematic in a lot of ways, but you know, the reality is if you give someone just a hammer, uh, to them everything looks like a nail. There are a whole host of resources and tools that are available to address uh, these issues, but the most convenient one is the hammer. And so you have people from limited power bases trying to address uh, a significant concern in their community, uh, and they sign on to that. And, and not being intentional about discussing how policing happens in black communities or the racial disparities that, occur, that at that time existed uh, in the number of people who were incarcerated or the impact downstream, the collateral consequences that incarcerating so many people on drug offenses would have to black and brown communities wasn't uh, necessarily contemplated. I think on a, a local level, some of the examples that, that I've dealt with that uh, continue to frustrate me uh, is this belief, and I think Dr. Terry talked about it, is this kind of universality um, of, uh, of application of the laws, that everyone will be treated the, the same. You, you look at anti-discrimination laws, they outlaw discrimination against categories uh, of people, and, and that's good, that's appropriate, uh, based on protected classes. But, but what gets left out of the conversation is whether or not there is going to be a, a cause of action for disparate impact claims, right? And so we're always left with proving intentional discrimination. And I, I mean, it's probably getting a little easier now because people are emboldened to be racist and say whatever they want. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, people have become a lot more sophisticated. Um, and, and they're not saying, yeah, let's get rid of the black folks here. 
or yeah, we don't want undocumented uh, immigrants working here uh, because they're brown. Uh, so, so, so there's not that intentional discussion about how race plays out in the things that are well intentioned. Uh, I, you know, and I look at something that does not necessarily have uh, racial implications that, that comes across as race neutral, and we look at the hands-free driving bill. Uh, in Massachusetts, the, there have been a number of people, too many people who have died because of distracted driving, because someone was texting and either ran off the road, ran into somebody else, hit somebody, and Massachusetts <laughs> is one of the few states that has not enacted a law that prohibits the use of uh, handheld uh, phones or other technology uh, while driving. And so there's been a debate on uh, the Beacon Hill to, to address that. And one of the things that we have done as an advocacy organization, the ACLU and several other groups, is to say, look, if we're going to give police more power uh, to arrest people, we already know that there are huge racial disparities in who gets stopped in communities of color, but throughout the Commonwealth, we need to have a provision that requires the collection of data and demographic data for all of the, the stops that the police make. And the reason we know this was because back in 2000, there was a law that required all Massachusetts municipalities and towns to collect data on uh, motor vehicle stops. And that was just a limited set of data because it was only for citations written warnings, and searches of cars. And what it revealed was that two-thirds of Massachusetts law enforcement departments had a racial disparity either in who they stopped compared to the population in that municipality uh, or relative to the entire population of drivers, or they were more lenient in giving verbal or written warnings, rather, to white drivers. And because of that, they were required to then collect data for another year on all stops. And so that had been the state of the law, but then after a period of time, people stopped collecting that data. And so we had been pushing to up the ante and say, we need to get data for all stops. And this has been like since 2004. Uh, the Stanford Policing Project uh, got some data from the Massachusetts State Police and s saw that there were uh, disparities. And so now here we are again saying, we need to get all of this data because we can't give the police more power uh, without being able to account for what they're doing with that additional power. And, and the compromise that comes up in this is taking us actually backwards. We don't want the data to become public. If you receive the data, it has to sign a non-disclosure agreement, and we're only going to collect citations, written warnings, and searches of vehicles, which is what we already have. And so the whole conversation in the negotiations uh, with the leadership of the House primarily uh, does not, the conversation of race with them doesn't hit in a way that compels them um, to move. And so if we're not talking about race in, in even these race neutral provisions of law and policy, we're doing a significant disservice and we're um, further cementing of uh, these impediments and barriers to people's uh, ability to thrive and to grow. So this is great. I, um, and it's a perfect segue. So I'm gonna, I have a question, and then I'm gonna throw it out to you guys, okay? Um, because I've been, I have notes all over the place. <laughs> um, and I wanna go back to, so a couple of things. So one, a key takeaway is that just because a policy is not explicit as it relates to race and its impact on a specific racial demographic does not mean that it does not have an adverse impact, a disproportionately adverse impact on a specific racial demographic. So that's one. Two is what I heard, is that if policy got us here, policy can get us out of the situation okay, as a potential solution. And with that, I want to use as the example, Dr. Terry's, um, I think it's, it's great, when we talk about economic inequality, major topic today, we know that in the city of Boston, the greater Boston area, widely reported that the average median wealth of an African-American family, and, when, and that's important because 
the data point specifically speaks to black American families. So those who are ancestors of those who were formerly enslaved in this country is $8, okay? And we know, as Dr. Terry shared, that one of the ways in which wealth is accumulated has been since the beginning of time in this country is through the acquisition of property. And history has shown us, the data is clear, that uh, black people in this country were through the weapon of policy in this instance, kept from acquiring that property, which has been used to build fam family wealth over generations, right? To the point where today, I wanna, I'm like, I wanna stand up. Can you, can you feel it? Cause I, I wanna see you all over here too. Um, um, to the point where today we have descendants, right, family members who, for some families, some, when we're talking about black families, home ownership has never been something that they experienced for some families. Policy got us here. Today in 2019, a major policy conversation that's happening on the national level is this question of reparations. And whether um, in this country, black people should receive reparations to help address the, the very real economic wealth gap that we're experiencing here across the country, not just in Boston. And so this question has come up specifically as it relates to reparations around, you know, we live in 2019 and although we are more enlightened around race than we were perhaps in 1954, we still struggle with talking about race. And so this question has come up, well, can we actually have an economic policy that specifically targets a specific racial demographic to address a historical wrong? Can we do that? Is that okay? Dr. Terry, you raised the question in your comments. Rasan, you talked about practically kind of how we go about approaching these types of questions and these challenges. So my question for the two of you, before I kick it out there, is can and should race be a factor when we talk about public policy solutions? Rasan. <laughs> uh, yes, it should. You know, there's always going to be the question of whether it will withstand constitutional scrutiny. Good. Um, this is a law school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and without any specific ties to intentional acts of discrimination that created uh, the harm, uh, it, it, it's a stretch. That said, I, you know, I can weave a, um, uh, a story of how, just like Dr. Terry laid out, uh, how structural institutional racism and white supremacy has impacted black communities in the way, uh, in the ways that it, that it has. Uh, but I just, I don't think there would be um, a, a lineup on the Supreme Court that would say, uh, you know, this, this is acceptable uh, under a constitutional standard. Um, even being able to generate the support at a local level uh, to get that uh, is a challenge. I, I think a perfect example is with um, the marijuana industry, trying to develop equity provisions in marijuana laws to, to compensate communities that were uh, destroyed because of the war on drugs. And now the people who are reaping the greatest profit from this industry look nothing like the overwhelming majority of people who were prosecuted for these offenses. And the best we could do for suggestions on how to address equity within uh, this new industry is to say, you know, special equity for pr provisions or licenses for communities that were impacted uh, by the war on drugs. Well, what does that mean for Roxbury that's being rapidly gentrified? Uh, where fewer and fewer black families are living. Does that mean that somebody who's white, who just moved in there, who was like a Whitworth student or a Northeastern student and had the resources to buy a home now wants to get a, uh, an equity license because they live in Dudley? 
uh, right downtown Dudley. So absent being intentional of race, we're never going to really be able to uh, reach the uh, address the problem. But being intentional about race creates additional problems. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. I think the, the critical question then to me is, how do you build a long-term vision and a long-term political movement to radically remake the structures of American jurisprudence? Yes. So, you know, I, as many of you know, um, the right did not look at the New Deal order and say, well, there's nothing that can be done. This is just how it is now. They set out um, establishing uh, groups within law schools, think tanks around the country, uh, training uh, scholars of American law and philosophy to, over decades, rewrite the, the, the very foundations of the New Deal order. I mean, it's like totally ravaged the protections that unions once had. Um, it's made uh, these kinds of claims, discrimination claims in the workplace, very difficult to prosecute. Uh, it's given corporations extraordinary power, including protecting their spending of campaign funds under freedom of speech jurisprudence. Uh, a similar movement with enough concerted action and long-term planning can be done from the opposite direction, one that does make uh, these questions a litmus test about whether the Congressional Black Caucus would support your nomination to the federal bench. Your vision of what do you think the Reconstruction Amendments mean? Maybe that should be a qualification of whether the Congressional Black Caucus, caucus is willing to support you as you rise through, through the federal judiciary. Um, because these things are not absurd. I mean, the, to me, the historical evidence is easily on the side of the people who look at the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and say, well, clearly people meant to unravel the structures of racial domination in the United States of America, and to try to do so without any attention to race uh, is going to be near impossible. Um, you, you know, the, the other important thing I just want to say very briefly then open up is, um, one thing that gives me a lot of confidence in this moment, which is full of despair in so many ways, uh, is that the shift in racial attitudes among white young people, um, basically Generation X and, and below, uh, who identify as liberal is totally unprecedented. So we have the most uh, liberal white racial attitudes among sort of left-leaning folks in the history of this country right now. Uh, actually, many white youth are to the left on racial issues of most black people. Like, that is astonishing. And one of the things I always would say this in panels is like, to me, like, there were, there's this great moment uh, when they had the white nationalist march in Boston. It was like 50 people showed up on the white nationalist side, and over 10,000 people showed up from the other side to shout them down. And there were, it was mostly white people. And to me, it wasn't, it wasn't like a normal racial play. It was, this was an intra-white contest mm -hmm. over what whiteness would mean going forward. Um, after Jim Crow, after the, uh, the racial resentments nurtured um, throughout the uh, neoconservative uh, era, that we're in the process of remaking all of those things. And uh, that gives us a lot of openings and a lot of exciting possibilities. And so it's a lot to be dispirited about right now, but there's actually a fair amount to take hope in uh, as we look to, to a kind of long-term restructuring of the foundations of the society. I agree. And I think, you know, currently we are, one of the issues we're trying to help address in the city of Boston is an issue that was, has been widely reported about um, the lack of access that black entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs of color have to contracts, city contracts in the city of Boston. <laughs> The city of Boston uh, spends about $647 million a year um, on services contracts. Less than 1% of those con contracting dollars go to entrepreneurs of color and, and or women. And so as we are trying to work with the city to develop strategies to address this issue, the question that keeps coming up, as Rasan mentions, how do we design a policy that 
remedies what we all collectively as a society, when I say all, I mean government, City Hall is supportive of increasing those numbers. From an advocacy standpoint, we're supportive. From a business, right? So everybody agrees. But this question keeps coming up around what policy can we craft that is intentional about remedying the problem along racial and gender lines that will pass constitutional muster. And so our response has been, at this point, we need deep legal thinking on this issue because we believe that we can craft a policy that will move the needle in a very substantive way but we also we need legal scholars we need lawyers to sit around the table with us to help really prepare for the challenge that we know will come right I, I, I push back on that a little okay. bit though you know Audre Lord said the master's tools will never destroy the master's house it'll give us a bit of an advantage yep. and I think that's where we are is with a bit of an advantage but because it is policy it is subject to compromise so you could have the best well-crafted law um, and in, in the creation of the law there are going to be significant compromises that are made I do agree with both of you all that there's there needs to be a long-term strategy mm -hmm. and vision about how we structurally transform uh, the architecture of oppression which is embedded in um, you know Supreme Court jurisprudence um, but but I also think about the power of um, uh, of allyship and working kind of outside of that, you, you, you look at Maynard Jackson in Atlanta. Uh, he created more black millionaires by building an airport in the Atlanta area uh, and, and making sure that those contracts got to um, uh, black-owned mm -hmm. businesses. And, and then we talk about this generational wealth uh, that gets created, and so there are opportunities to be more than allies and say, yes, we're going to do diversity and inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion work and make sure that there are more people invited in and try to develop a pipeline. We need to have accomplices for people who are just going to say, I'm giving my money to you. I'm giving the contract to you and whoever it is that are in positions of Yeah, power. but my challenge with that, and we haven't forgotten about you. Um, <laughs> my challenge with that, though, Rasan, is to get to systemic change, we need a systemic solution. And, we, and what we have seen, particularly, and we can use Boston as an example, a space where there has been tremendous economic growth and opportunity um, to demonstrate that, yes, there are people and institutions that have said, I'm going to give Rasan Hall, you're going to be a millionaire. And they're making you a millionaire, like overnight, because they're giving you contracts. But when we talk about the masses, I don't, I'm not sure that those individual or even small pockets of um, kind of success and opportunity are really positioning community as a whole. Yeah. Right? right? To to move forward. Yeah, and so absolutely. the systemic change, I do think, um, requires some radical thinking in how we think about policy. And inevitably, that's going to bring, or BC law, that is going to bring legal questions to bear. Sure. And so I don't, I don't, I don't, <coughs> none of us do, none of us in this room see the law as being stagnant. Right, And so I do think there's an opportunity for us in this moment, because of the political and social climate, for us to challenge current legal thinking in a way that actually might get us closer to systemic change on these racial issues. Just my thoughts. Anyone else? <laughs> yes. Can't hear you. Okay. Cindy's coming with the mic. I'm Cindy McNeil, and I am an 87 alum of the Boston College Law School. Josephine, you have to hold it up to your... Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, to go back to your discussion about reparations. Um, I don't think that we are at a point where people who have are willing to give up and because basically that's what we're talking about with all this. It means that somebody who has has got to give up something to try to correct some of these wrongs. What I am hopeful for, and maybe it will happen in the 2020 election if it becomes Democratic president, Democratic uh, 
Senate, to begin the discussion about reparations. Because I think the problem is that the history that you're talking about is not a history that most people are aware of. And th that's my hope for the discussion, that if these discussions occur, then people will become knowledgeable and maybe then they can look at the moral because in the end, this to me is, the law is wonderful, but, the, but we also need morality in terms of what's just. Not only legal, but That's what's right. just. And if we begin to have those conversations, then I think that that, that, that is possible. And with respect to Dr. Kerry, your comment about the young people, and I think it's, it's wonderful, but again, I'm gonna go back to what people are willing to give up. Some of the young people don't really have, they're not really, don't have anything, and I'm not, I know that they care, I'm not saying they don't care, but they don't necessarily have anything yet that they're giving up. I live, live here in Newton, and I can remember when Deval Patrick was running for governor. And I asked him a question, and I knew I was, wasn't going to, he wasn't really going to answer it the way I would have liked to him. But when you come to education, the problem, the inequity in education is tied to the way we pay for education, which is by property taxes. But in this community, which likes to think it's liberal, how many are going to say that you don't need to send X number of dollars to Newton, take some of that money and send it to Roxbury? They're not going to do that. And so one, somehow or another, we've got to get people to thinking, what am I willing to give up to make this society an equitable society? Sure. Um, I think, this is, I think this is all important. Um, it goes back to two things that I've been trying to lay out here. So one lurking in the background of our exchange and this exchange is the third pillar of what I was talking about. It's like, what kind of society do people imagine as just, right? So to put my cards on the table, my ideal society is closer to one where there are no billionaires at all than there is one where there, black people have the same percentage of billionaires as everyone else, okay? So these kinds of questions lurk even in the background of reparations discussions, right? So one of the things that reparations presumes is that you have a background story about what's just as a matter of economic exchange. Uh, we'll give you an example. Uh, the Homestead Act is one of the great wealth creation mechanisms in American history. Uh, some white working class folks were able to get land. Many more corporate entities were able to seize a lot of land uh, through some nefarious mechanism, some just market power. Uh, but it was a huge growth engine for wealth in the United States of America after the Civil War. Uh, and blacks were basically almost totally excluded from the Homestead Act. Uh, one way of reparations might be, look, let's look at, let's try to track the kind of wealth accrual from the Homestead Act and give blacks their fair share. But the problem with that, as many of you might have already started to put together, is that that land was illicitly and violently seized from indigenous peoples through warfare. So there is an injustice about the distribution and racial discrimination and the distribution of land, but it's premised on a prior injustice, which is uh, even more egregious, right? So the question of, to me, it's not necessarily like a standard of justice to like make sure that black people got in on the robbery as well. Right. <laughs> it's to try to say, now that we are all kind of fated to live together in this society, given this horrific history, how might we create a society that's worthy of people's assent and affirmation? Right? Uh, we can't erase the past. We can't make those people's sacrifices our uh, benefit, but we can start to build something that really does respect us as civic and moral equals. So it looks very different. So the, 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 the question about the, um, the, the school funding example, I think, speaks to this, because I think if you start to speak in those kind of broad sweeping visions, 
you start to unmask what I think is, tra is, is driving a lot of the white youth opinion, which is that they're looking up, right? People my age, my generation is slightly younger, they're looking up and they're seeing, well, uh, Harvard's preschool is $3,000 a month, right? Uh, it costs 75000 to go here as an undergraduate per year, right? Uh, many people are paying thirty and forty thousand dollars a year trying to win an arms race through private schooling, through property taxes, to get into places like Boston College or Harvard or BU. Uh, that's unsustainable. <laughs> that's unsustainable. We're asking people to outlay three hundred thousand dollars to these kinds of um, arms races, and they're not getting the return on the back end. That's why you have so many people feeling like there's a crisis of childcare, there's a crisis of higher education, there's a crisis of home ownership, and they're starting to see that in a lot of the ways that African Americans have traditionally been screwed over by the system, we're starting to be screwed over by the system. We're not getting the scaffolding to enter uh, into upward mobility, or it, it, it's sclerotic in a way that's opening people's eyes to the, the deep, deep structural unfairness. So I don't think it's any accident that you've moved in 15 years from basically 3% of white people supporting reparations to there being a 26% support uh, nationwide for reparations. Uh, people are starting to understand the, the structural unfairness and entertain pretty deep uh, changes to, to the order because they know that going this way is not sustainable. And I think the other piece, and, and it's a perfect, for me, it's a great illustration when it comes to policy, the types of things we need to think about. When, repar when this concept of reparations, when we first started thinking about it, it was your 40 acres and a mule. I don't think today I'm looking for an actual 40 acres and a mule, right? And so I'm, truly, right? Nice. I, I'm, Tanisha is not, um, although, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and so I think when we start to think about the, the concept of reparations as a policy initiative, I do think it's important to think about it in the, con the context of 2019, 2020, like in today's terms. I don't think in today's terms it necessarily has to be about give someone giving something up. I actually think that there's an opportunity for us to reframe the conversation in such a, such a way that we're thinking about increasing opportunities, expanding that proverbial pie, right, in a way that maybe Newton doesn't get additional dollars from the, um, from through the foundational budget process, right, so Newton may continue to receive from the state the same level of funding that it has received for the past 10 years because the school district is doing relatively well in comparison to the others. But when we look at Fall River, or New Bedford, because Fall River has other connotations today, but when we look at New Bedford, what we see is that, you know what, for them to even start to think about having an education system that's similar to, on par with Newton, we need to ramp them up. So Newton doesn't lose anything, it just means that New Bedford needs more. Right? In order for their young people to have access to the same level of education that students in Newton do. So my point here is that when we start to think about public policy and the intersection of race and, and kind of trying to undo the wrongs of the past or the wrongs of the present, I do think it's important for us to think about it um, in a way that is not, um, that, that is more asset driven than deficit driven. Right? Not the taking away from one group to give to another, but to simply provide others with more opportunity to, to get them to a more fair, just um, playing field. Yeah, I think one of the, I agree with you in that perspective. I think one of the, the problems that we run into is that there is this belief or a belief system around who deserves what. Right. Right, and so when we're talking about the distribution, well, because that, that's one of the current policy debates in Massachusetts right now around the right. Promise Act. That's right. and, and, and that's one that's looking specifically to provide additional funding uh, based on the number of students in poverty and the number of students with special needs. 
and, and there's this resistance to passing the Promise Act in, in favor of another act that doesn't have the carve out for kids in poverty at, for additional funding. And we know that there's the racial overlay when we talk about poverty as well. But every community, wealthy or poor, has kids with special needs. And so people can rally around that because it impacts them too. And we're deserving because we work hard and we pay our taxes and our child has special needs. So we want to make sure that the kids in our community get that extra funding for special needs. But when we're talking about poor kids, there's even if people won't explicitly say it, there's this inherent and implicit belief that poor people are poor because they're lazy and they haven't worked hard enough. And why should my hard-earned tax dollars go to that community? And there are these implicit biases and assumptions around who is poor and the caricature that pops up for, for poverty. So uh, you know, I, I, I think that's always going to be a struggle around uh, that issue. Yes. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about the um, Hi, uh, my name is Pedro. I'm a visiting scholar here. I'm a professor in Brazil. And uh, it's a great uh, honor to be here, a great, a great opportunity. And I arrived here in Boston last year, and I felt a lot of things that Professor Terry said, because I arrived knowing that I would, have, I would, I would, I would stay here at BC Law School. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I came with the family, my wife, three kids, and I needed to find out schools, oh. kindergarten. I have Three kids, one's nine, six, and four. They were so eight, five, and three. And what I did was I rented, I, I, I stayed in a hotel for one week. I rented a, a car and I started driving, trying to find out houses. It was a nightmare. Three kids in the back, very, very hot. <laughs> the prices of the hotel at that moment, summer was crazy in Boston. So I had one week and I extended for one more week and I couldn't, couldn't find houses around here. I knew I, I would like to stay in close to the school, I would like to stay in Newton. Wow. So that was a problem. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I knew already the school I wanted them to go because I saw um, a ranking on the internet saying that's, that, that's the best school in the country, one of the best, they say the third mm -hmm. best school. So I want my kids to go there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about this, anything that Professor Terry said anything about Mattapan, uh, Dorchester, mm -hmm. but I was talking to some Uber driving saying, don't go to those places, mm -hmm. they are dangerous. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Dor Dorchester, but there is another city called West Dorchester, There's, there is no problem there, but- West Roxbury. Roxbury. Yeah. Ro Roxbury. Yeah. West Roxbury. What? West is not a problem, the other one is Roxbury. Yes. Yeah. I was just about, but I want to take I'm my- sure that's what they I know that's what they say. For drivers. And I said, but I want to take them to the zoo that is close to this place. Okay, you go to the side of the zoo. You don't go to the other side. It's crazy. I know. And uh, <laughs> uh, I started, I found out um, the, the house, and I really understood what was going on, how they finance the school. Because the prices of the houses here are crazy. Yes. And I felt that I'm from Brazil, so you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and they say the American people, they buy houses in this neighborhood because they need their, their kids to go to the best schools. So the quantity of houses for rental are very few, 10%, and that's why the price goes up. And that's why it was very difficult for me to find out houses, especially because I don't have credit uh, history in this country. So it was crazy, it was a ni nightmare, okay. It was one year ago. <laughs> and uh, one day I was at the school. This Where did you end up? Uh, uh, can I, I, don't say the name of the okay, school. Okay, not yet. Because I, I wanted to say something oh, okay. about the school. Okay. Sorry, that's, I don't know. No problem, go ahead. Because they, they're, they're having the best education I would ever thought in my life. I, I'm very, uh, um, thankful for what, what they are having. I would never have this in Brazil, especially in the most expensive school in Brazil. It's a wonderful, I don't, say, I don't have anything to say about the school, that's fantastic. That's a, a, a great opportunity I'm giving to them for the rest of their lives. But the question is, I was one day waiting to pick them up at, 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 the, at the playground and talking to a friend and asking, uh, she's black, and I talked to her, I was saying, 
It's weird. This wonderful school here, we have more than 100, 100 um, five, 400 kids, I have 300, and I don't see any black here. <laughs> what is going on in this country? I asked her. Mm -hmm. And she explained to me all those things Professor Terry said, tax prices, how they finance. But she said, but there is a program called Medico. 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 Mm -hmm. And public policy says we pay to bring the kids from those places to here to have a better opportunity. I was also thinking, I don't know if it was that you said, Professor Terry, the bus, the yellow bus coming, and they coming from places and then changing the the, the quality of the of, of, of the neighborhood of the mm -hmm. so every day going in and out how many hours and seeing this transition crazy because where they live is totally different. Mm -hmm. But I asked why we only have six black people in the school? Mm -hmm. And the answer was people from here don't want. They block the program. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to to yep. to come first is this a reality? And second, is medical the program, the public policy, we, is this the best public policy we should have? Is this, shouldn't we put those money, uh, that amount of money in those neighborhoods and change the quality of schools that we have over there? Mm -hmm. Because I can imagine this kids going uh, more than one hour from their houses. Oh, every day to get a better, better quality. So, two questions. Uh, uh, is this a reality that people are blocking? Yeah. Second, uh, is this what we need or what we want to use a, a, a bus to carry the kids or shouldn't we put the money over there? Sorry for being so long and thank no, you no, for, no. so, so much this, for. It's a great example uh, from an education standpoint. And yes. so just so that everyone, so we can level that. So the MECO program um, is one, it was actually, uh, so a 1970s program that was at the time meant to address um, integration. Really, it was in, an integration program when initially introduced because the neighborhoods that historically were receiving neighborhoods were, at the time, predominantly white. Many of them still are predominantly white. And so the program was started um, to, yes, pr provide an opportunity. It's a busing program. Um, it was, yes, to provide an opportunity um, for, at that point in time, black students to access a higher quality education, yes, that was a benefit, but also on the receiving end for um, these neighborhoods and for these schoolhouses to be integrated. Um, and so, um, you know, and for over 40 years, it is a program that has been um, funded at the state level, gets significant state level funding, um, but it is up to the receiving community to say yes. So the receiving community has to be open to the program. It's not a forced busing program. It is a voluntary desegregation program. Um, they get to pick each student too, And right? they get to, and, and the schools identify the students, okay? Um, the MECO program is, has in recent years been highly debated because of the question that you put on the table um, in terms of whether the whether the dollars that are used to invest in the program um, are would be better used by investing in schools in the neighborhoods from which the students come. Um, that's a longer conversation, but I do think um, it's, a, it's, again, kind of the example of MECO that you put on the table, absolutely, this was a racial desegregation policy program that was put into place. Um, it has been highly successful in many cities and towns around the Commonwealth um, because yes, it has added racial and ethnic diversity to schools that would not other have, otherwise have it. And we believe, you know, those of us who do education policy work do believe that diversity in a classroom actually enhances the educational um, outcomes, right, of the students. Um, and two, um, it also had a benefit for students who were leaving very, you know, at the time when the program was first started in the 70s, you know, very troubled Boston school, public schools district. Um, so there was a benefit on both ends. But do you all want to, either you want to speak to? Yeah, just um, 
so two things very, very quickly. Uh, Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton wrote a very uh, famous book called Black Power. And one of the great interventions that that book makes is it's critical of a certain type of integration that it calls one-way street integration. Uh, and it's an integration that presumes that anything predominantly black is going to be necessarily bad. And it's critical of forms of integration that don't try to, that just try to cherry pick individual African Americans or small cluster of African Americans, give them uh, benefits, and then allow them to kind of spiral off into the American elite. Instead, the, the, the sort of intervention is to say, well, what we need to do is make deep, deep investments in changing um, what some policymakers call a choice infrastructure so that black parents aren't in the position of saying, well, I either send my kid on a bus for now, I mean, if you want to send your kid to like Concord, yep. right? Or I mean, Cohasset. yeah, you'd be on the bus for an hour, two hours. Uh, so I could either do that or I could send my kid to a uh, uh, collapsing public school nearby with various safety issues and, 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 and other kind of professional concerns. So that's not a fair choice for anyone to make. It's a choice under duress. It's a coercive choice. So how can we change that infrastructure so that there are some people who might choose, even in a fairer society, to send their kids to a different neighborhood, but that that choice isn't always already a coerced choice. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is that we also need to understand, when we talk about suburban school districts, that there are lots of people in this ecosystem. So one of the things that I've become increasingly interested in is changing elite college admissions uh, and connecting that to the integrationist project. So what would it mean if Harvard were just to explicitly say, because we care so much about diversity and inclusion, we want to attract students who already have that experience. They're going to be students who understand what it means to be in a diverse school.